Hey everyone, welcome back to part two of topic five in our database class. In this video, I'm going to provide a review of normalization. This will prepare us for the next part of this topic, which will be on denormalization. Let's get started. So as a reminder, the reason that we're interested in the normalization process, one of the, the major drivers behind that is if we have a design that is not fully normalized, then what that means is one or more of our tables will be susceptible to these modification anomalies. So again, the idea here is that by virtue of the design alone in a fully normalized solution, we can rest comfortably knowing that our database design is nearly immune, almost entirely immune from the possibility of these modification anomalies occurring. Those being insertion anomalies, update anomalies, and deletion anomalies. So if we have a fully normalized design, which for our purposes, again, is typically third normal form or above, then we can happily dismiss any concerns that we may have about those types of modification anomalies contaminating our lovely database. So as a reminder, three different types of modification anomalies. We have these insertion anomalies or insertion problems. And these occur when we try to insert data into a relation. That is, we try to add some additional information to the table. And in so doing, we create some kind of problem. And with insertion anomalies, it's usually creating a bunch of empty cells where there really shouldn't be any if we had a better design. So we're wasting space. Update problems, right? These are anomalies or problems that arise when we attempt to change or modify existing data that is already in a relation or already in a table. Okay, so if we go in there and we try to change something, it creates a problem. That type of problem that occurs with an update anomaly is usually some kind of inconsistency with other rows within the table. And it arises because we, in a non-normalized design, will typically have duplicate data. It's very common to have duplicate data. So if we change one of those values by doing an update, we now would have inaccurate data in our table unless we scan through the entire table and make that change for all of the duplicate copies of the, uh, the record that we want to update. Okay. So these update problems usually manifest themselves in the form of some kind of inconsistency in the table where things are not what we expect because we did not have a fully normalized design to start out with. And the resulting duplicate data causes these problems when we try to make a change. And finally, we have these deletion anomalies or deletion problems. And this particular anomaly occurs when we try to delete data. So in our efforts to delete one or more rows from a table, we're causing a problem. And that problem with a deletion anomaly usually manifests itself in the form of losing additional information or additional data that we would have wanted to preserve. So with a non-normalized design, when we go in and delete something, we have a risk of potentially losing additional information that we would want to keep. So again, when we have a fully normalized solution, we don't have to worry about any of these things it's because just by virtue of the design alone, we're not going to be unnecessarily wasting any space. We're not going to have to worry about doing many updates on duplicate data because in a fully normalized design, each information about each instance of an entity is stored only in one place in the table or in the entire database. So we don't have to worry about having duplicate copies of things all over that we need to really look for and update in order to maintain the overall accuracy of the data in the database. And we don't have to worry about these deletion problems as well, because everything is broken down in such a way that, you know, each row in a table represents just one instance of that thing, whatever that table is intended to represent, be it a product or 
supplier, a customer, an employee, a department, an order, whatever it may be. Right. So we're, we don't have to worry about it because if we're deleting something, we are deleting just that one thing. And we're not going to accidentally be getting rid of information that we may have wanted to retain. Okay. So our design protects us from these kinds of problems or these kinds of anomalies in a fully normalized solution. Do remember some of the terminology that is involved here because this will appear in the context of denormalization as well. We talked about dependencies and remember dependencies speak to the relationship among the attributes within a table. So a functional dependency is uh, this relationship among the attributes in which a, the value of a particular attribute can be used to find the value of another attribute. So you can think of this as candidate keys or primary keys have these functional dependencies in there, right? And it's fine, but generally what we want in a fully normalized solution is for all non-key attributes to be fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key. So functional dependencies are a part of normalization in that way. Right? They tell us if things are making sense. So we don't want to have partial dependencies, right? Where maybe one or more of the non-key attributes in the table depends only on part of the primary key. If we have, say, a composite key, we want it, all of the non-key attributes to depend on the entire primary key, not just on part of it. Or we can have transitive dependencies, if you remember those. And that is a situation where, you know, one attribute depends on another, which itself depends on a third attribute within the table. So those are undesirable as well. So in a fully normalized design, we want every non-key attribute to be fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key. A determinant plays a part in this dependency relationship because a determinant is simply the attribute that we can use to find the value of another attribute in the relation. And uh, in a fully normalized design, we want all of our determinants to be candidate keys. That way uh, we know that if I know the value of the candidate key or the primary key, then I can use that to find the value of every other non-key attribute in the table. And remember the concept of candidate keys. These are all determinants. Right? So a candidate key is a determinant because its value can be used to find the value of every other non-key attribute. And uh, we differentiate between simple keys and composite keys. That is how many columns or attributes are involved in the key itself. All right. So all of that then leads up to a discussion of normal forms. And in our class, we will typically draw the line at fully normalized right here. Right. So if we can hit that target of third normal form or Boyce-Codd normal form, which is a slightly more stringent version of third normal form, then we can say that our design is fully normalized. Otherwise it is not. So if we're in second normal form, first normal form, or in not any normal form at all, if we just have some big messy list of data, then we don't have a fully normalized design. But I did want to point out that there are higher level normal forms. So you can have fourth normal form, fifth normal norm, normal form, domain key, normal form, DKNF, sixth normal form. Right, and there are certainly place times and situations where these higher level normal forms would be appropriate. Essentially, the idea is as we move from lower normal forms to higher normal forms, we're having smaller and smaller and simpler and simpler and more and more tables in our database. And uh, by adding that increased real complexity, we are reducing the chances of any data anomalies occurring. Okay. But for our purpose, since we're designing for business, like we can stop here or here, right? We don't need to worry about these things, but uh, if you're designing something like, I don't know, let's say that you're designing like an air traffic control system. Yeah, you probably want to use higher level normal forms just because it's such a mission critical use case that some of these higher level normal forms may be more appropriate for that. 
So if you go and work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and you're designing the ACE that will hold information for the next Mars rover, don't stop at voice cod normal form. Study a little more, use higher level normal forms, because if you're sending something that costs hundreds of millions of dollars across the vast expanse of empty space, you want it to work on the other end and not have any anomalies creep into your data. Okay. So we consider a relation or a table to be fully normalized when we reach a situation where every determinant is a candidate key. Now that technically is BCNF, voice cod normal form. Okay. So every determinant appearing in the table, if it's a candidate key, then we're in BCNF. This is also sometimes called 3.5 NF, because right? it's just slightly more stringent version than third normal form. And in functional cases, there almost always is no difference between third normal form and, and voice cod normal form. If you go out and examine a hundred different real world business databases, the difference between third normal form and, and voice cod normal form won't be anywhere in, in that database design. But uh, there were a few really odd, rare scenarios that were brought to the attention of, of COD, who was the original developer of this entity relationship model. And so they created this slightly more stringent version, the uh, 3.5 normal form to account for that. So generally, if we can hit at least third normal form, we're not going to be susceptible to these modification problems. So that is our usual target. Now, just a visual example, we start with the parenthetical relation up here at the top, which is also represented as an entity over on the right. So we have our parenthetical relation here or a customer relation, and we can see what do we have in here. We've got a customer ID, presumably the customer's name, address, city, state, postal code, zip code in America. And then we have some information about that customer's accountant. So we've got their account ID, the name of the account and the phone number of the accountant for that customer. However, looking at this, I have these imperfect dependency relationships among the attributes within the table. So in this particular case, I can use the zip code, postal code as a way of determining the city and the state. And if you think about that, you'll realize that that is true, right? There is not any single postal code at least not in the system used here in the United States that applies to more than one city or state. So that is, if I know the zip code, I know the city and the state associated with that zip code. Okay. So that means city and state depend on the zip code. As modeled here, however, we have city and state depending on the customer ID, but that's not true. City and state depend on the zip code, and it is the zip code that depends on the customer ID in this design. So this is one of our little dependency problems in this particular relation. It's not a fully normalized. Another one is the relationships among accountants, right? So we know that account name and account phone depend on the accountant ID, right? As we have it currently modeled in here, Accountant name and accountant phone depend on the customer ID, which is marked as the primary key. And we know that's not true. If we know the accountant ID, then we can know the account name and the accountant phone. So it is the accountant ID upon which those attributes depend. And as far as a customer is concerned, the accountant ID then depends on the customer ID. So we have this sort of transitive relationship here. Right. These two attributes in this design depend on account ID, which itself depends on customer ID. So this is not fully normalized. Right. This, by the way, is an extremely common example that's given when talking about normalization and denormalization. For those of you who are interested in such things, this is an acronym. In the United States, we say zip code, but more generally it's a postal code. This is an acronym for zoning improvement plan, in case you're curious. And that's where the zip comes from. Sorry for a little segue there, <laughs> returning back to 
normalization, we have these dependency problems at this design. So we know this is not a fully normalized solution. And to normalize it, we have to break this single table design apart into three tables, an example of which is illustrated for us here. So we can see that we now have customer information that lives in the customer table over here on the left. So all of this information in here relates to the customer. We created our zip code table. So all of the information in there relates to a zip code and we've created an accountant table and all of the information in there relates to an account. So this is a fully normalized solution that would be impervious, generally impervious to those types of modification anomalies that we described earlier.